Hello, uh, my name is Matthew Menard. I'm a vascular surgeon at Brigham Women's Hospital in Boston, and I'm delighted to be here uh, with Dr. Gomez Sanchez, uh, my co-discussant. We're going to talk today about peripheral arterial disease and, and critical limb ischemia, the most severe form. Uh, Clara, do you want to say hello? Hi, everyone. I'm Clara Gomez Sanchez. I'm um, uh, one of the new attendings over at uh, University of California, San Francisco. So just starting out my career in vascular surgery, and I'm delighted to be here. Unlike Clara, I'm not just starting out. I've been uh, kind of at this for a number of years, almost 20 years. And we are going to talk today kind of uh, how we approach patients, how we think about their care from the different perspectives. Uh, again, I'm, I've been around a while, and, and Claire is fresh at it. But Claire, let me start you off in the discussion. So you, you got a patient coming into your clinic or you're consulted in the, in the hospital, and uh, she's got a pretty severe critical limb ischemia. So what are, what are the things that are going through your head as you um, kind of meet her and, and think about talk, taking care of her? Um, well, first, you know, in setting just a goal for the interaction, you know, the goal of all of the interventions that we do are really to, you know, save the limb, salvage um, their function and their ability to uh, engage in the kind of activities and quality of life that they um, that they want to. Um, and in order to do that, from my perspective, it really has to be approached very holistically. You know, you can't um, focus solely on the the wound or the limit at hand without also taking into account all of the factors that have brought them to that critical point in their lives and in the, you know, the end stage of this, this bad disease. So some of those things include, you know, behavioral habits. Um, if, if someone has been a smoker for a long time, um, also a lot of their, their understanding and education around their medical problems. So for example, do they understand sort of the role that their diabetes or, or their high blood pressure might be playing and, and sort of the, um, the worsening of their uh, condition. Um, and I think it's very important to sort of weave these, these things together. Um, you know, what the patient is coming in with as far as their history, um, what their limb currently looks like, and what kind of goals for um, quality of life and function uh, we can hope to, to achieve with intervention. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. You know, it's a it's been a little bit of a frustrating um, course over time in, in one sense because we have not had a lot of medical therapy uh, to treat peripheral arterial disease. That's changing a little bit. Uh, some good good trials that we might touch on a little bit later have shown some promise. Um, but in terms of the different treatment options that we have available, um, maybe you can kind of tell us what are the, the main ones and you know how you how you think about which one you might lean on uh, in a different situation. Yeah. So the one of the exciting things about vascular surgery as a field is that there's been incredible innovations over the last few decades, um, and so some of the more traditional methods like open bypass, where you basically created a new pathway for blood flow to to go around an, a, a blockage in the artery. Um, have been uh, supplemented or in some instances replaced by uh, techniques that are more minimally invasive, endovascular techniques uh, in which you uh, operate almost entirely within the blood vessels, which of course allows you to avoid some of the big open incisions and some of the morbidity of, um, of some surgical bypass procedures. Um, and potentially this is very exciting because it can open up treatment options for patients who have a lot of other serious medical comorbidities that may limit their eligibility for, you know, extended procedures, general anesthesia. Um, so there's, there's definitely a big combination. And I think, especially in my stage right now, just starting out my career, one of the really challenging things in vascular surgery is figuring out how to integrate these different tools into really um, well-defined algorithms for how to approach each individual patient. You know, I, I'm always leaning heavily on um, my colleagues who have a lot more experience than I do because 
you know, trying to figure out who is most appropriate for the endovascular technique versus weaving in the open technique is something that is um, still a little bit more art than science, although hopefully that is starting to change. I'm going to actually um, segue to a few, um, a few a few slides that might uh, help kind of put some of this into context, but uh, many people in the audience probably know this, but we're really looking at an epidemic of peripheral arterial disease and, and critical limb ischemia in general, um, driven by all sorts of things, obesity and increase in metabolic syndrome, the aging of the population in America and, and worldwide, um, but mainly driven by diabetes and just a staggering kind of uh, escalation of rates in, in the United mm -hmm. States alone. Um, there's almost a hundred uh, million uh, folks with pre-diabetes. Add to that 30 to 40 million people with diabetes, and you can see almost uh, or more than a third of our population uh, has, you know, diabetes now or will have it. And so it's just a, it's a true tsunami of of kind of disease that's coming around the corner. This is a little bit of a complicated slide, but it just it, it highlights the morbidity and mortality of, of the disease. And if you um, look at a year, uh, almost 20 uh, to 40 percent of people will either have died or have lost their limb. Uh, it's just a highly morbid and, and fatal disease. And what I'm going to do is kind of show you a slide, Claire, and, and that might um, be an interesting kind of way of, of taking the audience through our thought process. So this is a very typical patient with uh, critical limb-threatening ischemia, 86-year-old. She came into the hospital with debilitating rest pain and then got transferred uh, to my hospital uh, when she was found to need uh, heart surgery. She uh, wasn't too interested in her heart surgery. All she cared about was her legs, wanted to get back to dancing. Um, she had very reduced ankle brachial indices, 0.31 on the right, 0.35 on the left. And when someone checked toe pressure, she essentially had no flow at the toe level. Over the course of me meeting her uh, over the week or so after her heart surgery, she developed bilateral heel ulcers. This was actually the better of the two limbs. This is the angiogram, and you can see pretty, uh, pretty well-preserved aortic inflow and iliac arteries, although she does have some disease of her uh, proximal uh, left iliac. Mm -hmm. If you then kind of follow it down into the thigh, um, you can see a pretty severely diseased um, superficial femoral artery and, and popliteal mm -hmm. artery. And then um, you can see the runoff is not perfect, but you know she's got one pretty good, pretty good runoff vessel. So, um, what are you thinking when you? Um, when you see this kind of an angiogram and this kind of a patient? Yeah, so there's a few things going through my mind. You know, um, she's here with rest pain, which of course is, is you know, very, you know, ischemic rest pain is very painful. It's hard to really enjoy anything in your life with that. But she also has these wounds on her heels and heel wounds are particularly dangerous, particularly risky for limb loss because if that, sort of gets deeper and gets to the bone. There's not a lot of like surgical resections you can do that really maintain a lot of function or ability to walk. So they're particularly high risk, um, you know, wounds when in, in my mind. Um, and then thinking about sort of the patient herself, um, she's fresh out of cardiac surgery. So there's certainly, um, you know, significant concern for performing operations in this person. You know, she's, um, she's newly revascularized, which is great, but she's also still in a window where she can have a lot of complications post-surgery. So kind of balancing <clears throat> uh, the need for limb loss with her, her general risk of surgery is, is certainly of concern. And, um, and then sort of lastly, looking at this anatomy that, um, that these angiograms are demonstrating, she, um, as might be expected from someone who has, you know, the most severe form of, of peripheral artery disease, um, she has multi-level disease. So there's some in the iliacs, there's some in the SFA popliteal lesion, and then certainly some in the tibial segment as well. So she represents a pretty complex um, anatomic picture. 
um, you know, from in an ideal world, someone fresh from a heart surgery, uh, you'd want to do sort of a minimally invasive approach. Um, but on the other hand, with disease this complex, as far as her anatomy goes, um, I'd be pretty suspicious of how durable um, your, your revascularization would be if you address this from an endovascular standpoint, um, especially that, you know, that uh, popliteal segment um, with those very sort of chunky looking uh, calcific plaques, I'd be, I'd be pretty worried, um, may not respond uh, well to endovascular approaches. So, um, you know, certainly this, this is a complex patient, but I, you know, I would need to have some multidisciplinary discussions with her cardiologist and, and such, because I think that ultimately the leg might be better served with a bypass um, if we think that she could tolerate it from, from, you know, an overall clinical standpoint. Yeah, that's a, that's a great answer. It's a, I think it's a good case because it just highlights the complexity of the decision tree and the algorithm. And um, historically we haven't had a lot of good data uh, to support this. We, we did recently publish the results of the best trial that was focused on this very, this very question, the best CLI trial recently published in the New England Journal, um, looks at patients just like this that are considered candidates for both uh, kind of the more invasive surgical bypass option and the less invasive endovascular option. We actually found that surgery did a little bit better, but um, your kind of uh, thought process highlights the, the, the many different variables we have to uh, think about as we're trying to make that tough decision. And to your earlier points, we absolutely want to bring in the, the kind of thoughts and desires of the family and the patient. And as I kind of alluded to, she's a bit of a spitfire. And, you know, all she cared about was getting back on the dance floor. And um, I, I was concerned about the same things, really giving her a durable result. So let me push you a little bit. What do you think you would uh, kind of, if she pushed you and said, you know, gee, what do you think is the best thing for me? Um, what do you think you would? You would recommend? Um, you know, with the, with the knowledge that I would need to know a little bit more about her current cardiac status after surgery, um, I would say um, if I did a, a brief attempt at an endovascular, um, you know, crossing of these lesions near the popliteal on this initial angiogram, you know, you, you might consider trying an endovascular approach, but I would really lean more towards a bypass for this patient. I think that for somebody who's coming off the dance floor, who um, is very functional at baseline uh, and who wants to get back to that, I think that that's her best bet. And I think a lot of times the first thing you do um, to a patient probably has the best chance of um, really solving their problem. Uh, I don't I don't, I prefer not to have a situation where I'm trying one thing and then trying another and trying another, because every time you wait and see if that worked, um, I think you run the risk of losing more tissue. Um, so with the, with the assumption that, you know, her cardiac status is, is good enough to handle general anesthesia, um, I'd probably urge her towards a bypass at this point. Yeah, I think a lot of people would, would probably attempt an endovascular uh, revascularization in this setting, but I, I kind of uh, had the same conclusion that you did. You know, it highlights the, the, the point that there are times when we just accept even a little bit of tissue loss. If someone has um, a little bit of dry gangrene of their toe or an ulcer that um, doesn't seem to want to heal, but it's not really bothering them, it's certainly appropriate to just um, kind of uh, tolerate that and treat them conservatively with kind of close close management and close follow-up. There are other times when really the right answer is to proceed with an amputation, uh, a primary uh, above or below knee amputation, uh, depending on their ambulatory status. Um, but if one were to, to move to revascularization, you know, this highlights that often we do have a choice. Um, I wanted to give her a real durable result, and so I I did undertake a bypass. She did absolutely great. I did the other side a couple of weeks later, and uh, about three months later, she had healed everything up and was doing great and um, really uh, pleased with the result. Recently, I've seen published a phenomenal um, trial that 
I can only imagine took an extraordinary amount of work to, to perform. Um, when you were in the planning stages for the best CLA trial, how did you imagine sort of the, um, the outcome fitting into our, our overall understanding of how to care for patients with PAD? Yeah, thanks for that, that question, Claire. So, you know, just to set the stage a little bit, the, the best trial, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, was a, a randomized trial. It was funded by the National Institutes of Health, and it, it really looked at a subset of patients that were thought to be eligible for both treatments, both open surgery and, and, and the vascular therapy. And it was a question when I was in your shoes, maybe a few years out, I was well trained in both. I came out of fellowship, kind of fired up. I did a lot of endovascular therapy, and then started to to wonder if I was doing the right thing for my patients. They didn't seem to be getting the same degree of of kind of perfusion or or um, kind of firepower that you can get with a surgical bypass. So we we created this trial. We um, somehow at the poor thought to have a, a quality of life component and a cost effectiveness component. And so, you know, it, it really allowed me, but all the investigators that took part, and there was over a thousand across the world, to really put to the test uh, our own treatment biases. In the absence of data, and as you well know, there's, there's very little data to support the, the, the decisions that we've been talking about today, um, to put it to the test. and and to say, okay, I, I have this personal bias that surgical bypass is better. Let me test it in a really scientifically grounded way. The results uh, just came out. Uh, as I mentioned, they were published in the New England Journal um, electronically about a month ago and uh, presented at the American Heart Association. And in the first and largest cohort, and those are folks that had a good quality saphenous vein, so the best case scenario for bypass surgery, surgery was more effective. It was more effective at preventing amputations and preventing reinterventions. Um, there was a second smaller cohort in which uh, a good segment of saphenous vein was not available, and so you were using what we call disadvantaged conduit prosthetic bypass or arm vein. And in that case, uh, the results were very similar between open and endovascular in terms of the, the quality of life results, they were very interesting. They did not parallel the main clinical results. And so the main finding was that both, so, so the very first main finding of the quality of life analysis was that the quality of life in critical limb patients was extremely low, extremely poor. Both endovascular therapy and open surgery uh, dramatically increased the quality of life very early on, as early as three months. And it was sustained out to the four years that uh, we looked at patients. Uh, but there was no real difference between open surgery and endovascular therapy. So we got to dig into the data set a little bit more and try to figure out why that is. Um, but, but very interesting results. And hopefully that'll be a foundation that, you know, further studies on quality of life can build on and, you know, further studies in this uh, just general arena, arena can build on because that's just the first step to to really establishing a much bigger handle on, on are we doing the right thing in our decision making. Mm -hmm. Claire, let's let's touch on um, another topic. So, you know, we've been talking a fair bit about critical limb ischemia, and, but as you well know, there's a whole other subgroup of symptomatic patients that have claudication. Um, what are your thoughts about, you know, how aggressive you are with a patient, what you're thinking the first time you see a claudican in your in your practice, what are the different options in terms of treatment uh, outside of revascularization? Um, give me give me your thoughts on that. My first thought is really to gauge how much it's really impacting their life to have this type of symptom. Um, somebody who notices it but is able to do all of their daily activities, all of the things that they want to do, um, as somebody that I'm not inclined to be particularly aggressive in their treatment as far as like going towards surgery, uh, because certainly no surgery is without its complications and you can always make things worse if you, um, if you aren't careful. Um, so step one is really, is this impacting your ability to work, your ability to engage in the activities that 
that for you really make your life um, happy and, and worth living the way, you know, the way you want to live your life. Um, the second thing to consider is where those that uh, disease sits sort of in their global picture. So is this somebody who is managing their other medical comorbidities appropriately? Are they, you know, on appropriate diabetic medications, hypertension medications? Are they on a statin? Um, do they still smoke is really a big uh, factor because um, we know that smoking is, is a huge risk factor for progression of disease and for them not having as good outcome as, as you'd like. Um, and then beyond that, um, I think before you would really consider surgery for someone like this, um, encouraging them to take care of all those comorbidities and to start regularly exercising to try and um, uh, to address their symptoms um, in a more natural way before you have to do an intervention on them is is ideal in order to maximize their ability to um, regain function with minimizing their uh, risk of causing a complication. Yeah, no, that's a great answer. It really highlights all the all the factors that we need to consider. You know, I um, I'll just say it was a real uh, victory for for the field. And a real testament to the doggedness of the vas our vascular medicine colleagues uh, who were able to uh, get CMS to approve payment for, for walking programs. So uh, a stand um, standardized exercise walking program uh, is now reimbursable and that, that goes a long way. There's still a real shortage of programs to refer patients to and that's a real problem, but um, it highlights the importance of Kind of first line care being risk factor reduction, as you talked about, second line therapy, a real walking program, and only if they uh, have really failed that, consider more aggressive therapy. The downside being, you know, you intervene on someone and a year later, two years later, you, you could have that patient returning with uh, a more advanced uh, form of disease, breast pain or heaven forbid tissue loss. Um, the natural history of claudication is relatively benign. There is a school of thought that says, hey, if we can get them walking, then that's better for their overall health, that's better for their heart. Mm -hmm. um, and th those are real considerations. But um, I think, um, you know, you highlighted the, the things that we think about. So I want to just switch gears a little bit, Claire, and, and talk about the, the kind of a subcategory of folks with peripheral arterial disease that we're seeing more and more is this concept of polyvascular disease. Um, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that? Are you seeing that a fair bit as well? Or, um, and, and if so, do you approach these patients any differently? Absolutely. I think that, um, you know, the risk factors that we understand for PID are also risk factors for atherosclerotic disease and other vascular beds. So, you know, your cerebrovascular disease, your coronary artery disease, all of them um, sort of have slightly different pathophysiology, but they all seem to have very similar risk factors. Um, so I think this, this um, leads back to sort of the idea of the holistic approach to the patient. So um, understanding that somebody with PAD, especially PAD that's bad enough for them to have symptoms, probably has some degree of vascular disease in other beds and, and it would be um, sort of incomplete to not um, assess them for these other risk factors. So, you know, when you're assessing somebody for their functional status to determine, you know, what their goals are and what you might expect to, to restore as far as their function for PAD, you also have to consider if some of their limitations could be due to, you know, coronary disease that hasn't been um, addressed. Um, and certainly any major intervention you do on the, the leg um, in the setting of, of coronary disease that hasn't been addressed can put them at, you know, sort of extraordinary risk. Um, so, um, you know, you have to kind of approach these patients knowing that they are at high risk for multiple different issues. Um, and then, you know, education, I think, becomes incredibly important as well, um, so that they understand that some of the things you're doing for them are not just for their leg, they are also for, you know, prevention of strokes, prevention of heart attacks. Um, I think sometimes that helps to put 
these things into context uh, for patients and really drive home the um, uh, the need to be a partner in the care uh, in their care of their peripheral artery disease. Yeah, no, those are all great points. I, I totally agree with you. You know, for me, it, it highlights, um, you know, really where we are in kind of the investigative or the um, kind of academic uh, pursuit of our understanding of these different disease uh, substates. So, you know, over the course of the 20 years that I've been in practice, really we've, we've approached these in a very siloed fashion. So, you know, our cardiology colleagues looked at the heart, we looked at the legs and the, and the neck, but we didn't really have discussions about the intersection between the three. And I think that's changing. I think um, our, our cardiology and cardiovascular colleagues have really woken up to the, to the um, burden of peripheral arterial disease. And the American Heart Association has put out kind of a call to arm and directives to kind of focus on peripheral arterial disease in a, in a real way and we're all starting to realize the overlap in terms of the medical care. And I think some of the more challenging aspects of the care of, of these patients are, are balancing kind of what antiplatelet agents they should be on, what lipid lowering or cholesterol lowering agents they should be on, and what antithrombotics they should be on. It can be very complicated. Um, you know, when I was starting out, there was sort of aspirin. Everyone was on it. Over time, obviously, the, the use of Plavix uh, became very prevalent after any coronary intervention or any endovascular lower extremity intervention. And now with, um, I'm going to show you the slides, or, or I'm going to show you the results of the that Evolocumab, which is a PCSK9 inhibitor, and that is very effective at driving down the LDLC uh, to dramatically low levels, as low as 30. And as a result of that, there was a, uh, an astonishing kind of drop in the major adverse uh, cardiac events or MI, stroke, and death, but also this uh, concept called NAIL, a major adverse limb event, uh, lower amputation rate, lower return to the operating room for urgent revascularization uh, mm -hmm. and acute limb ischemia. So that's kind of one category of medications. And then the COMPASS trial followed by the Voyager trial, both looked at rivaroxaban, the, the kind of DOAC, um, Zeralto, and the same thing, just a, a dramatic improvement in both NACE and male. And so it highlights the question about, you know, gee, should all of our PAD patients be on um, Zeralto or rivaroxaban? If so, uh, should it just be aspirin, which is what the trials showed, aspirin plus uh, two and a half milligrams twice a day of, of rivaroxaban, or should it be Plavix and, and Zeralto? Um, a, a complicated kind of choice now that uh, it's, a, it's a good thing, but I do find myself having lots of conversations with my vascular medicine and cardiology colleagues about optimal management. What do you uh, think about that kind of medical choice and um, maybe say a word about your thoughts on statins as well for this complicated group of patients. Yeah, I think this is, as you said, there's more and more data coming out that aspirin alone probably isn't the most ideal. But of course, you know, you're balancing a lot of risk factors because certainly people with PAD, um, you know, are they steady enough on their feet to have multiple, you know, thrombotic agents at the same time? Are you putting that risk for bleeding? And I think um, every choice has to be sort of individually fitted to the patient, but certainly um, the data is very compelling that, um, you know, probably two agents of some sort is, is the way to go. Um, and I think over time, we're going to figure out really what's more ideal um, uh, as far as balancing the PAD outcomes and the CAD outcomes, because I think, um, you know, you start to you don't have as much data um, in the PAD world as you do in the coronary world uh, to support one regimen over another. 
I certainly, um, in patients that don't have, you know, active issues with their coronaries um, at the time, tend towards following the Voyager trial, um, using that low dose of rivaroxaban in addition to an antiplatelet agent. Um, but uh, I also try to approach these things in a very multidisciplinary with a multidisciplinary mindset when I do have someone who has active disease in other beds, because I would like to hear what the cardiologists think their risk profile really is before I make a decision that's driven more by a PAD centered outcome versus both uh, and vice versa. Um, so certainly um, a complicated issue and one that hopefully I will feel comfortable with as more data comes out. Yeah, no, I, I think that all highlights, you mentioned it earlier, but, you know, I think our patients really benefit from a multidisciplinary approach uh, if they have diabetes. Um, and it, almost 70% of our patients in this category do, right. you know, making sure there's a diabetologist or an endocrinologist in the mix or, you know, their, their primary care doctor or cardiologist is really on top of their uh, glucose management. Certainly all the efforts to stop smoking, which can be very challenging, but mm -hmm. using, you know, good medical therapy to help do that is important. We talked about statins. I, I think pretty much every PAD patient of ours should right. be on either 40 milligrams of Crestor or mil, mil, milligrams of Lipitor, if yeah, not absolutely. additional agents, as we talked about, good, good blood pressure control, um, you know, and then a good discussion with, with the rest of the team on um, you know, what's the best antiplatelet and antithrombotic regimen. I think all of that is, is kind of front and center. And, you know, again, as you, uh, reference to a thoughtful discussion, um, between the different providers and, you know, we're vascular surgeons. We, we, most of us do both endovascular and open surgery, but, you know, our interventional radiology and interventional cardi cardiology colleagues, uh, do endovascular and um, it's sort of important for them to pair up with a surgeon and just have a good discussion uh, right. because the, the real take home is complicated patients. We really need to do an individual, you know, tailor the care um, given the complexity to the individual patient and working right. with them to, to see what they want and, um, you know, ultimately help relieve their pain and if things work out, uh, salvage the limb and get them back on their feet. Right. So any, any sort of final thoughts on, on everything we've talked about? It's, I feel like we could talk for hours on, on <laughs> for hours, I'm sure. topic, but. Um, you know, one of the things I've noticed with statins in particular that, um, you know, that I, I try to sort of educate patients and anyone I encounter on is that, um, you know, patients will say, well, my lipid panel looked fine. My, you know, they told me I didn't need anything for it. Um, but really, you know, there's, there's a multiple different ways that statins are really impacting the progression of their disease. And so even patients who have, you know, um, LDL levels that, you know, aren't particularly elevated probably will still benefit from the statins. And that's a little bit of, of an education process as I convince people, you know, this is, your, your panel looks okay, but there's still a good reason to be on them and to continue taking them um, beyond simply like getting the number to a certain number. Um, I think some of the sort of um, uh, sort of things that they have been told in the past um, become less, uh, less true when we are dealing with sort of active PAD, you know, symptomatic PAD. We, we know it, it really does make a difference, even if you had relatively well controlled lipid, lipid levels beforehand. Well, you're going to think I'm making this up and I was, I was sort of laughing as you were talking because I literally had that exact discussion about an hour ago. I, I came right from clinic and I had an 80 year old patient who I met at the time of her heart surgery. And, um, she is on at the time that she had her heart event, she got, uh, bumped up to a high dose Lipitor. And she was asking me now that my heart's fixed, can I come down on it? Uh, right. I've, I've heard, you know, all sorts of tales of woe with, with statins and I could luckily use the fact that she had, you know, moderate carotid stenosis to, to give her the same lecture that you just kind of alluded to. And it was, it was a fact that she thankfully um, kind of got the message. But maybe in closing, one last comment, be great to get your take on it too. But one of the things that's been really gratifying to see 
just in the last couple of years, last, you know, one, two, five years is a real focus on number one, recognizing that, that there are uh, dramatic disparities in the care that we're giving uh, with regard to um, kind of vulnerable populations that a real outsized burden on the black community in mm -hmm. terms of, you know, not having a higher amputation rate, not getting revascularization at the same rate, not being on the same medications, taking a longer time to get revascularization, um, the same with the Latinx community. And and um, I think it's a real focus of our field and it's long overdue, but it's I think it's great to see we've got a long way to go to understand what the different components of the disparate care is. But I'm curious, you know, was that prevalent in your own training and do you share that sentiment or, or do you, do you see it a little bit differently? No, absolutely. And I think um, where we are standing right now is the point where we're acknowledging that these things exist and where we would like to go is figuring out how do we actually fix them. But um, certainly in my training, I have seen a lot of this. Um, my training, I had a wide variety of sort of settings. So you had some of the more um, traditional academic hospital with more of a community-based and then a county hospital that's more safety net. And you see a lot of really severe end-stage disease there, um, of patients who just didn't really have access to care um, and who have a lot of other factors that really play into their health care. So some of these, what we call social determinants of health. So for example, how far do you have to travel in order to get a fresh fruit or vegetable? Because if you have to travel significant distances, the likelihood that you're going to have the time, the energy, the money to go all that way to buy you know, food you need for a very healthy meal is relatively low versus somebody who lives in perhaps a more affluent neighborhood or, or near a grocery store. It's very easy to follow the diet that your endocrinologist or primary care physician uh, recommended to you, you know, a, a low salt, uh, low sugar, all those, all those dietary choices become not choices if where you happen to be living or your economic situation or your social group somehow is, is sort of impacting the availability of, of those foods. And so I think that um, certainly coming from San Francisco, there's been a big push to start to understand some of these things that are really impacting a patient's outcome that have a lot less to do with the actual surgery that they get um, and a lot more to do with just how they're going to respond to that surgery, how they're gonna heal afterwards, what kind of risk factors are gonna send them right back with a new set of problems. Um, and certainly that I feel like is a big focus as people are realizing how impactful this really is. Yeah, I know oh, that's great. Uh, you know, the only thing I would add to it is some great work's being done in terms of figuring out how to optimize care in, in kind of remote areas of, of the country and, you know, really utilizing remote care, um, you know, a patient taking a picture of their foot or on a Zoom call, kind of doing a foot exam remotely and looking at a wound, looking at an ulcer, tracking it over time, because uh, obviously it's a challenge if you, if you have to go four hours or two hours or six hours to get access to, you know, a center that can really take on challenging critical limb patients. Um, so a, a lot of promise and, and hope that we're going to move um, a good distance in, in kind of rectifying that, understanding it better and, and kind of bringing better care to, to all the patients that, that need it. Um, so listen, this has been a great discussion. Uh, really appreciate your perspective. Um, and uh, really appreciate everyone joining us today, and and hopefully you found this helpful. Uh, take care. Thank you so much. It's been it's been lovely to have this kind of discussion.